James Jonathan Norman from the Major Projects Knowledge Hub and today I'm delighted to be talking to Bryce Hoffman who is best-selling author and president of Red Team Thinking. So Bryce, welcome. Thank you Jonathan, it's a pleasure to be here. Let's, let's start with the fundamentals. This idea of Red Teams and Red Team Thinking, what, what is it? What does it mean? It's an excellent question. It's Red Teaming is a concept that was developed uh, by first in the US and then, then additionally here in the UK by the military and intelligence community after the intelligence failures that led to the terrorist attacks of 9-11 and then the disasters that occurred in the wars following that. So starting in the US, uh, the, the intelligence community on September 12, 2001, realized that they had a problem because they had all of these signs that showed that the United States was going to be attacked, and yet they failed to connect the dots until the terrorist connected them for them. So the CIA created something called the Red Cell, and the job of the Red Cell was to take and look at all of the information that was coming in, and look at what the staff analyst believed it said, mm -hmm. and argue that the opposite was true. Okay. That there was another way of looking at it. Not because the analysts were necessarily wrong, but to challenge their own thinking. Then the military, the army in particular, after the, the wars that they thought they had won in, in Iraq and Afghanistan, suddenly started to look a, less, a lot less victorious, uh, realized that they'd made some colossal mistakes in, in planning those wars and made some really, really tremendously faulty assumptions uh, about what the world in the aftermath of the war would look like. And they wanted to make sure that they didn't make these mistakes again in the future, and so they created a lessons learned team. And one of the main outputs of that team was a recommendation that you create a, a team, a separate team from the team that developed the strategy in the future to look at the strategy and try to stress test it, to try to pressure test it, to try to poke holes in it, to find the weak spots in it. Again, not necessarily because the strategy is wrong, but because you can make it better that way. Yes. And they called this red teaming. And they set up a, a, a school and started training uh, officers as, as red teamers to play this role uh, throughout the military. And it was so immediately successful that the, the MOD adopted it and created their own red teaming school uh, at uh, MOD Shrivenham and created their own red teams. And then it spread to Australia, to Canada, New Zealand throughout the Commonwealth, and even NATO uh, ultimately adopted it, though they decided that, that they didn't like the idea of having teams, it was too confrontational, so they <laughs> called it alternative analysis. All right. <clears throat> so what it really is, is a set of tools and techniques that are designed to take your strategy and deliberately challenge it, deliberately stress test it, deliberately put it under kind of a rigorous scrutiny to make sure that that there aren't any unseen threats that have been missed, or, and this is important as well, any, any opportunities that have been missed. Yes. And, and it's also a way of overcoming groupthink within an organization by kind of seeking out divergent thinking. Yes. And it's a way of kind of introducing contrarian thinking to the planning process to, to kind of think out, give, you, give an organization tools to think outside the box. Okay. People like to say that, but they don't really know what they mean by that. It's easy to say, well, we should think outside the box, but it's a lot harder to do unless you have a methodology for doing it. So that's what it provides. So it's a, in some ways, it's a kind of response to that glib question, what's the worst that could happen? Exactly. You know, and, and in fact, one of the tools that we teach, which is called pre-mortem analysis, is really designed to do that, to answer the question, what's the worst mm. that could happen? And to say, well, here is what the worst that could yes. happen is. And not just what is the worst that could happen, but what are the steps that lead from that potentially very bad scenario mm -hmm. back in time to today. Okay. So we now see not just the worst that could happen, but the steps that led to that failure. Yes. And when we see the steps that lead to that failure, two things happen. One is we can, we can adjust the strategy, adjust the, mm -hmm. adjust the plan mm -hmm. so that we don't take those steps. Yes. But we can also turn them into signposts that we watch for as we, as we proceed with the plan, as we, as we proceed with the project. And when we see one of those signposts emerge, we go, remember when we were looking at that, when we were red teaming that, that mm. was one of the things that led to, to a major failure. So maybe we should hit the pause button for a moment here and make sure we're not headed in that direction. Yes, yeah. I can see an immediate analogy and, and I can see where that fits with sort of classic scenario planning where 
you will often project forward and say, this is where we want to get to. Let's work back from there and work out how we get to that. Yes. And I guess red teaming is, this is where we want to get to. How do we make sure we don't get elsewhere? Exactly. So it's, it's, it's kind of turning the whole scenario planning model on its head. So in that sense, it's very complementary to scenario mm. planning. But you know, an interesting thing happens when you turn, when you, when you turn the, the analysis on its head and you, and you look in the other direction. It actually makes your brain work differently. And if you look at the emerging science around neuroplasticity and things like this, you're calling on different parts of your brain when you do this. And this is really important because red teaming, when it was created both by, by the intelligence community and by the military, the people who created these tools drew very heavily on the past 40 years of research into cognitive psychology and the human decision-making process. Work done by people like uh, Nobel Prize winning uh, psychologist economist uh, Daniel Kahneman and his colleague Amos Tversky and others. And, and what that research has shown in thousands and thousands of experiments is that no matter how smart we are, no matter how well educated we are, no matter how successful we've been in the past, we all fall victim to an array of biases and blind spots in our thinking that lead to catastrophic failures sometimes. Mm. And so this is really designed to help the individual overcoming those biases and blind spots and heuristics that, that kind of cloud our thinking unconsciously and help the organization overcome the blind spots that are created by groupthink and other organizational yes. defects. Yeah, I mean that, that takes us very neatly into the world of major projects because um, we do learn a lot from the past, but we tend to be defined by the last project that we produced. Um, and the next one, particularly in, in major project terms, could be very different. Um, so so being, using heuristics that we learned from what we were doing before may or may not be a good thing to do. Absolutely. Well, you know, one of the things that's, that's fascinating is if you look at uh, most mutual funds in the past 10, 15 years, most of them have underperformed the average as a whole. Dow Jones, whatever the Tootsie, uh, FTSE, uh, whatever average you're looking at. Um, and, and, and so the question becomes, how does that happen? How do people who get paid millions of pounds to manage these funds get their job in the first place if they, if they can't do better than simply dropping a pound in, in each stock on the, on the exchange? Well, the answer is because they've been successful. Mm -hmm. They've been so successful in the past that they, they think they've cracked the code. And when you start to think you've cracked the code, then you stop checking your work. You stop, you stop organically red teaming. Mm. You stop stress testing your own ideas. And you start to think, I know how this works. I know how this market works. I've done it a million times in the past. Get out of my way and let me do that. Right. And the same thing happens on, on major projects. You know, I've built, I've built you know, three railway terminals before. I know how to do it. No problem. Let's knock this one out. But each one is different, isn't it? And, and the more sure you are of your, the more confident you are of your abilities, the, l the more prone you will be to make problem, to, to run into problems. That's why it becomes so important to have a mechanism to challenge your stuff. Mm. It's mm. not because your, your, your thinking is bad necessarily, it's because it will be better if you're forced to challenge it. Okay, well let's talk a little bit about the, the nature of the red team and, and the structure of the, the process. So, so Typically, what, what's the makeup of a red team? So it, it's really important uh, when, you, when you're setting up a red team. Um, and a red team can be set up on an ad hoc basis. Uh, it doesn't have to be a permanent standing part of your organization. But what you really want to look for is diversity. And I don't mean just diversity in the, in the kind of affirmative action sense, though that is important too. I mean diversity of experience, diversity of age, diversity of background, diversity of skill set. Uh, because bringing people from different backgrounds together is, is, leads to different perspectives on a problem. And, and red teaming is really about starting with divergent thinking and moving to convergent thinking. Because if you don't start with divergent thinking, mm. you may miss the best idea. Yeah. You know, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a, people are very familiar with groupthink, but people are less familiar with another very uh, dangerous, I would say, organizational dysfunction called satisficing. Satisficing is really, unfortunately, how most organizations make decisions. It sounds like you're familiar mm. with satisficing, though. So satisficing, for those who don't know, is, is basically the, the process of 
trying to figure out how to solve a problem, and as soon as you find a workable solution, you go good back. enough. It's yeah. good enough. Yeah. It's we we figured it out. Let's execute, mm. and that's understandable because because we want to solve problems. We want to get on with our work, which is which is which is good. The problem with that is that what if that's not the optimum solution? What if there's a much better solution that you didn't pursue because you found this simpler one first? You don't know until you, and, and so again, that's why you need to have divergent thinking to try to capture as many ideas as possible and then ensure that the best idea wins, regardless of where it comes from in the organization, right. whether it comes from a junior engineer or the owner of a firm. So uh, are you, is red teaming something that will be used at a kind of macro level or more at a micro level? So would you, you're imagining that you're going to do this major project, is that the stage at which you, you check the, the scope and the requirements and the plans right. using red teaming? Or is it more during the project where you're making interim decisions? Um... So I, I would say that there's a role to play at both, but it's primarily at the beginning. Okay. Um, you know, red teaming should never should should never become an excuse for an action, and it should never be allowed to delay action when action is required. But that said, so formal red teaming, like mm. we talked about, having a team is something you would absolutely not want to do yeah. during the execution of a plan. You want to do it up front and you want to adjust the plan. This is an important concept. The job of the red team is not to make come up with a different plan or to prove the plan wrong or to prove that they're smarter than the planners. The job of the red team is to make the plan better. Mm. So that's really important to keep in mind. So they do that up front. But once, once the decision is made to go forward, their work is really done. And, in, and they would just get in the way if they continued to second guess decisions. Now that said, there's some, some red teaming tools that, can, that are much lighter, that can be done as an individual or informally mm. with a couple of folks, you know, that sometimes are, are good to employ just as general best practices to make better decisions in the field. And so you can profitably and, 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 and usefully and beneficially use those tools but not the formal red teaming process. Okay, so the, the red team will have a degree of authority within the organization, but they're not, they're not second guessing the senior decision makers. Absolutely, and, and that's very important to say. I mean, I, I, I would say they don't have an, a degree of authority okay. because red teaming, red teaming, the job of the red team is not to make a decision. It's to provide additional information to the decision makers. So what that looks like in practice is you know, we have a plan to, to build this rail network, this rail line. And it's a good plan. We've read team comes in and looks at it and they find a couple of potential major risks to the, to the long-term success of this that the planners hadn't, hadn't considered. They, their job is not to say, hey, we're not, we shouldn't do this. We, we've nixed this, we've, we, we've vetoed this plan. No, their job is to say to the decision makers, We've looked at the plan, you've asked us to look at it, mm. and here are some ways that we have identified that this plan could potentially fail, that we don't feel have been considered, and here are our recommendations of how they could be addressed, how they could be addressed right now to make sure that those failures don't happen, or mitigating strategies that we could employ if they happen to make sure that the, those failures are limited in scope. And it's presented as recommendations, and it's up to the senior decision makers to decide whether to move forward with the original plan or to modify it. So they're not, they're not taking authority away from the leadership at all, and that's really important. And if, in, in the organizations where we've had the most success with red teaming, the red team views its client as what we call the blue team, which is the, the team that originally developed the plan. So they see themselves as working for the blue team okay. in the sense that we're here to help you make your plan better. And when you're able to do that, it becomes a very collegial and constructive collaboration. So without revealing any state secrets or <laughs> any confidentiality yeah. that you shouldn't, yeah. do you want to give me some examples from the work that you've done and the clients that you've, you've worked with as that, to how this has worked and what the kind of outcomes you've had? Absolutely. And unfortunately, most of my clients I do have NDAs with, so I can't, yes. I can't name specific companies, but I can give you an idea of some of the industries that we've worked in. So we've, we've worked in uh, banking sector, uh, global banking, uh, telecommunications. Uh, we've worked in the high-tech industry. 
in the software industry, in the dot-com industry, insurance, healthcare, uh, and even in construction, right. uh, and, and, and large construction, a company that, that builds nuclear power plants, hospitals, okay. and sports arenas. Mm. And so uh, it, it has wide applicability in these areas. Right, right. And are there, are there examples, again, without revealing any, any secrets, of, as, as to the kind of, kind of thinking that's emerged from the process? Yeah, so, you know, one of, one of the ways that, that uh, well, I'll, I'll, talk, I'll talk about one that we did in the, in the uh, construction arena, because I think it might be more interesting to your members. Uh, they were looking at, the firm we were, we were talking was looking at purchasing an Indian firm that had a rather unique construction methodology of rapidly building, uh, you know, uh, I would say mid-rise uh, buildings. And using a heavily automated process with you know raising floors and things like that. Yeah, kind of pre-manufacture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the the company, the, the the CEO of the company is very keen to do it because he sees that the future lies in a lot more automated mm. building. But there, but what? But he asked the red team to that we worked with to look at this this purchase strategy, and and what the red team you know, pointed out was that this type of construction right now is, I mean, this, this type of technology right now is primarily suited for, for, for kind of low to, to low middle end construction of like, you know, public housing and dormitories and things like that. Yeah. And they said, look, that's good. We could get into that business, mm. but our brand is high end. We build sports arenas for, for, you know, major sports teams. We build, you know, uh, uh, university buildings for, for premier, right. you know, Ivy League yes. universities. Yeah. Is that really going to help our brand to get into that business? Mm. Or is it going to undermine our brand? Because some people will say, oh, yeah, they, they build these nice, you know, university libraries, but look, they build this, you know, subsidized housing too. Mm. It's not very... Yeah, interesting. Yeah. yeah, and so that was something he hadn't considered. And mm. he decided to, he actually decided to pursue it but to just to basically create a flanker brand yeah. to do that under, so it's separated. Yeah yeah yeah, 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 yeah. Very wise. Yeah, yeah. So um, imagine that I'm a and I work for a major projects organization. How how might I get started in terms of thinking about how we might adopt red teaming? So so there's a, there's a lot of different ways that you can bring red teaming into an organization. You can, you can if, you, if you have the, the resources of personnel is really what it comes down to, you can train a group of folks to serve as an ad hoc red team within your organization. I mean, there's, there's really no organization that we've worked with outside of the military and intelligence community that uh, can, can have the luxury of having people whose full-time job is being red teamers. So if you're a large organization, you can train, you know, six to, to ten people in these tools and have them along with their day job be available to look at major projects mm. and and before they're before they're finally approved and stress test them one thing by the way that the, 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 a team like that can do really well for um, probably many of your clients is a lot of companies that we've worked with use red teaming in the bid process right. So what they'll do is, is they're not red teaming the actual strategy, the actual plan. They're red teaming the proposal, and they and and they they basically, you know, if it's if 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 the client is a government agency, for instance, and say it was the Ministry of Transport, the red team plays the Ministry of Transport, and they and they their 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 mission in a case like that is to pretend that they're the the, the, the MOT, and uh, and they're going to reject this. Okay. So do your worst, but tell us why you're going to reject it. Now, if you're very lucky, a lot of big firms are. We've worked with firms where they have former employees of, mm. of, the, of, the, of, the, of, of the agency they're trying to submit a bid to. They can sit them on that team to provide kind of inside information. And then they look at this and they do their best to try to say, this is why we're going to reject this proposal. And they send it back. Now the team can address those concerns can 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 try to try to 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 obviate those issues and what we found is and this is this is really compelling what we found is when companies do this and they submit their win rate is 
tremendously higher than companies that just kind of send it out and hope for the best. Yeah. Uh, so that's one way. But um, you know, a lot of times, even setting up an ad hoc team is is challenging for an organization because people have other things to do. So one of the things that we've started doing increasingly is is what we call red team thinking. Um, and red team thinking is, is different than formal red teaming because it doesn't require you to set up a team. It's less rigorous than formal red teaming, but it's also a lot easier to do. And, and so red teaming is basically taking some of the concepts of red teaming, but, but teaching them in a way that people can use them individually or with a small group. And then they can use them at any stage in a project just on, on decision making. And that can often be a lot easier way for an organization to get started. And then if they see the value in that, then, on, then it becomes easier mm. for them to justify, you know what, let's actually train some folks and get them to the point where they could actually do a real in-depth in analysis. Because while the tools themselves help you think more critically as, as, as an individual, as the Nobel Prize winning econ economist Thomas Schelling once said, the one thing that no one can do, no matter how smart they are, is come up with a list of things that would never occur to them. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Well, that's that's fantastic. I mean, I, I think the the application in the major projects industry is is has a huge potential. I mean, we agonise a lot over lessons learned and and our and our continual ability to repeat the errors of the past. And and clearly, that's one of the things that red team thinking and red teaming is designed to do. So, thank you very much. Thank you. Been a pleasure.